Welcome to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the, oh my gosh, I almost said the Red Glare podcast there, RJ. I know, I was just thinking that. (laughs) Welcome back to the Deep Dive, everybody. We'll just go ahead and start with that and keep us loose and it'll all be good. Uh, Welcome back to the Deep Dive podcast, everybody. Uh, we're here to talk about another week of Kraken hockey. Uh, as what happened with the previous episode we had released, RJ, news then dropped the next day. Did that to us again this past week. I don't know what that's about. Come on, Kraken. Just just, just wait it two days. That's all we ask. Just two days before you make our podcast irrelevant. They do love those Tuesday news drops, don't they? They really do. Um, I would say that we should just record on Wednesdays or something, but then it's going to be Thursday news drops. Exactly. They're, they're going to do it. No matter where we do it, they'll just do it the morning after. It's just the way it is. Um, so we'll, of course, get to the you know the McCann extension, Geo, trade deadline stuff, because that's a week away. Lots of fun stuff. However, I'm told that there is a potential controversy on Twitter involving a controversial tweet from a member of the Kraken, RJ? That's right. Uh, Cole Lind uh, decided to jump headfirst into the greatest controversy of the day uh, and tweeted this uh, yesterday. You ready? Yeah. If you think there are more wheels than doors, you're out of your mind. Yeah. So Lind, of course, is referring to the big Twitter controversy of the last few days. It's like that, the new version of that dress that was, you know, is it black and blue or is it, you know, white and gold, whatever. Uh, the the controversy du jour, are there more wheels or doors in the world? Yes. And, and Cole Lind clearly thinks it's doors. Right. And, and you just told me about this literally two minutes probably before we started recording i had no idea this was going on (laughs) i'm not on twitter that much i guess um and my gut reaction was he's 100 percent right there are more doors than wheels in the world easy peasy like no question okay because that's not what i was thinking what is your rationale there um that you know think of a building and how many doors and entryways there are in a building you know, just one building. Uh, if you think about things like cars, right? Cars got four wheels. Well, generally, they also got four doors on them. Uh, think about <laughs> think about other places in the world, right? People have houses and shelters that have entryways and doorways, right? Whether it's a wood door or a cloth or even if it's just open, that's got a door, but they might not have a car. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's just more doors than there are wheels. Okay, I, I like your argument with there with the cars, and I'd say cars themselves, cars are a wash. It's completely. Right? But wheels, I think that's where you have the hidden numbers there. You look at, you know, uh, factories, you know, production of things. You have lots of wheels that bring things from, you know, one place to another. I guess it also depends on, you know, how loose you want your definition of a wheel to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I, I would think, you know, a wheel doesn't have to be something that, that propels a vehicle, right? No, it doesn't. But I think those numbers add up. You look at a factory, I think, you know, generally you've got more wheels on conveyor belts and things like that than the amount of doors in the entire building combined and probably by a pretty large number. Yeah, but that's just in factories that happen to have conveyor belt like setups, which is not all buildings. Right. But again, it it's the scale of it. It adds up so much. I don't know. I don't know. I, there are so many buildings in the world, RJ. Everybody. There's so much production going on in the world. <laughs> and then there's other things like, you know, is what constitutes a door, right? Because if we're going to get loose about, you know, wheels aren't just things that propel vehicles or do stuff like that. Well, then what constitutes a door? Is it just any sort of um, passageway from interior to exterior? Because then, you know, you could have several in a row, kind of all in one little section there. You know what I mean? Like, no, you need the door there that, that blocks it. I, I mean, a door that you can open. It's not like, you know, an hey, archway if, is not a door. If I unscrew the hinges of the wood piece of my door, what is what is still there? I mean, the door is still there. No, I know, but the doorway is also the there. The doorway is still there, yeah. but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doors, not doorways. Right, but but a doorway is a door. It's a passage between, like I said, it could be, if it's open, it's a passage between interior and exterior. That's a, 
that's it. That's a door. <laughs> like the door is is what's there in the doorway. But then is if if I hung a sheet or the cool beads because I live in the seventies, right? Is that a door? Because mm -hmm. it's. I would argue, you, yes, no, okay. it's it's separating a room from another room. It's a door, but it's not a piece of wood, right? All right. If if, if a sheet or or those cool '70s beads get to be a door, then ball bearings get to be a wheel, and I win. No, those are spheres. Yeah, <laughs> I got you. I knew you were going there. I, for some reason, I had that in my mind too. I was like, no, I've got that argument down. That's my nuclear option. If I can get you to agree that ball bearings are are wheels. That it's all over for you, and you know that. Uh, yeah, no. Which, you know, I should know better. Weeds. I know you're smart. But anyway, Colin has his take on it. Let us know what you think. If yes. you're watching this on YouTube, tell us in the comments. You know, tweet at us. Is Colin right? Uh, yep. Are Colin and Dylan both right, or am I right? I'm actually not liking my odds seeing how that stacks up. But uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, remember, if you vote against me and Colin, you are voting against goalie kisses. Think very carefully about you know what response you leave after that. Damn. All right. I don't. <laughs> That's my nuclear option. <laughs> there you go. Well, you you just exercised it there. So Dylan, should I? Okay. If we get Cole in tomorrow, because the Kraken are coming off a long road trip, their yeah. first practice coming back is tomorrow. Yes. If you ask Cole him. In, you ask him. I, I better. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. ask him what his rationale is. I won't argue with him like I did just did you there. I won't. I won't turn it into that. But I will ask him what his rationale is because I think we need to know. It's just unexplained. He didn't. He didn't follow it up anywhere. Well, I mean, he was pretty definitive with his wording. It wasn't like. Well, no, well, he, I he, think he maybe. Well, no, no, but no. He, we know what his position is. We just don't yeah. know why. Yeah, that is so, true. That is true. I'd like a little clarification. You know, this is the hard hitting journalism that we need to do, Dylan. This is why we have access that we the access that we do. Yes. We need to make sure to take advantage of it. Uh, certainly, certainly, when the season is you know over 60 games in well out of a playoff spot uh just just keeping your head above the last place in the league yeah, this i mean this is the way you keep people engaged i think oh yeah certainly we're banking on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure all right so um some other fun stuff happened this week i think one of the things you and i both wanted to talk about was um you know jt brown wasn't able to be a part of the broadcast this past week because uh got covid Seems to be doing all right. You know, really happy about that. Doesn't seem that it's it spread around his house or anything either. So happy he's, you know, healthy and, and all that stuff first and foremost. But it meant we had, you know, someone has to be with John Forslund during the broadcasts. And it meant we got Allison Lucan. And I thought she was fantastic. Yeah, agreed completely. And uh, just a great move by, you know, the, the broadcast team. Like, again, it's tough when you have someone... You're, you know, your colored commentator just going out pretty much unexpectedly, right? It's COVID. It can mm -hmm. hit anyone at any time. And uh, Allison, I think, was the perfect choice. You know, what, what she brings to the broadcast and kind of a different voice. And we'll get into kind of the details of why we liked what she did. Um, but I like that they were kind of, you know, about the decision. They were so quick and decisive about doing that and, and kind of how they presented it all. Yeah. And obviously the fan base, very, very happy with it. Um, went over well with everybody on social media and during our post games, right? I mean, it was something that we talked about, I think, during every post game that she was a part of. So um, it was very, very good. I think the number one thing I liked, which, you know, she does during the intermission reports and, and anytime, even on Twitter and stuff, right? She can break down complex you know, nuances about the game and just explain them in very easy to understand and concise ways, right? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like you and I can explain a lot of stuff, but maybe the, the concise part, especially with me, gets lost a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start stalking circles around it sometimes. Um, but she just nails it every time. And it, that was just so enjoyable as part of the broadcast. And I know a lot of the newer fans to hockey really, really appreciated those moments. Exactly. She's really great at teaching the game. And like you said, doing it in a concise way in a way that everyone can understand, which is not easy to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just go try and explain something, you know, you, like you said, you'll kind of run circles around. It. I think that happens to most of us. But, you know, she's very good at that. She's very good at distilling that information and often pretty complicated information, too. Um, I liked, you know, that 
I like to see kind of that window into basically how she is all the time. Cause I've, I'm lucky. I get to see her at the practices at the morning skates and, you know, kind of how she is you know, off camera. And she really has this, you know, intelligence and this curiosity about her too. And I think we saw that displayed on the broadcast in a couple of ways when I, I think it was Forslund who was asking, wondering, you know, do these too many men penalties happen more often on these periods with the long change? And, you think intuitively they might, but of course, Allison, being who she is, goes and looks it up, finds a statistical based answer, and that yes, in fact, they do. And, and here's the backing for that. Uh, and she does that all the time. I mean, there's there's lots that you know the viewers don't get to see, but where somebody in our group will ask a question, and she'll go and look it up. You know, there was one about keeping lines together earlier this season, how effective that is, and do the Kraken do it as much as other teams? And she was able to deliver that data in maybe you know less than ten minutes. It's incredible what she's yeah. able to do, and so quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't. It would take me ten minutes to figure out where I should even go to try to figure something like that out. You know what I mean? <laughs> like mm -hmm. it is, it is truly remarkable the work that she's doing, and uh, just to hit the ground running. I mean, the first game in the broadcast booth was just awesome. Yeah, she looked like a natural too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you would think she'd been doing it for ten years. Yeah, <laughs> the way that she sounded, she was so confident. Um, yeah, and and I think really the Kraken. I think we're discovering this season, you know, between her and Everett, too, hopping on the broadcasts, mm -hmm. they have to have the best broadcasting depth of any team in the league, right? Yeah, and we talked about that during a couple post games, but it's, I, I can't think of any team that even comes close, really. Uh, it's It's been fantastic, so um, enjoyed having her. You know, as part of the broadcast, is she still going to be doing them? Do we know when uh, JT I, comes back? I think no. When JT comes back, I think it'll be his chair again. She yeah, said I, she just keeps the chair warm. But yeah, I mean, I just do we know back. when JT's coming back? Is he going to be back Wednesday? I think it will be next game. Okay. I think it will be Wednesday. All Not a hundred percent on that, but I think I heard that somewhere. Okay. All right. Just wanted to get that in there. Um, all right. So maybe we should go ahead and address the big news last week. The Jared McCann extension. Obviously, it's been, you know, talked about by everybody in the fan base uh, multiple times by now. We've addressed it during almost every single post game on Twitter, all that stuff. But now's our chance to kind of, you know, maybe take a deep dive because that is the podcast we're on. This is not the Red Glare podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what we're here for. That's what we're going to do. Uh, Jared McCann, just to recap, you know, he signed a five-year contract extension with the Kraken. Uh, that was, I believe, on Tuesday, right? Yeah, the day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after the last podcast. And um, yeah, so five years, $5 million per year. So that's $25 million total. It buys four UFA years because he was a pending restricted free agent. So it buys a lot of unrestricted free agent years and keeps him with the team for another five years beyond this one. Yeah, and even having now close to an entire week to digest it, I still have no idea how Ron Francis pulled this one off. It's impressive, right? It's insane to buy that many UFA years for a player who is flourishing, finally getting an opportunity to show what he can do, um, to get all that at such a reasonable cap hit with such a reasonable team-friendly term. It's long enough that you are buying those UFA years, but you're not extending them into his mid to late 30s or anything. You know what I mean? Like, like it's just this perfect contract. And like I said, that $5 million cap hit, if he's going to deliver you, I mean, he's probably, you know, barring an injury, knock on wood, going to at least hit 25 goals. You're going to get a 25 goal scorer who's going to be consistent like that, play center, you know, back check as well as he does. All of those things for $5 million. I mean, that's what they were paying those kinds of guys eight years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, Yeah, the contract looks like it could have come from, you know, a little while ago. And that's, again, really fr impressive on Ron Francis's part. Uh, and I think that also speaks to kind of the culture of the organization too. And, and you look at the term, the term is very difficult to get with a player of that age because McCann so close to unrestricted free agency. You know, if you're a player that is looking to maximize the dollars and the term that you get mm -hmm. ultimately over your career, which, you know, players generally tend to do, you want a short contract here. 
Yeah. In this, you want a short contract. You want as little term as possible so you can be walked to unrestricted free agency where you have a bunch of different bidders. The whole league, you know, it could, could potentially bring you in and that's going to drive the price up and drive the term up. So McCann, from a monetary standpoint, has every incentive to want a shorter contract. Mm -hmm. Now, the team, of course, probably wanting more years. Mm -hmm. But when you hear McCann talk about, you know, why he chose to sign this deal, you know, he clearly wanted to get something done with the Kraken and he wanted term because he likes it here. He likes the organization. He mentioned that they gave him an opportunity too as a first line guy and they treated him right. You know, and that's why he wanted to sign for that kind of term. And so you look at Ron Francis and I know we've kind of given him a hard time about, you know, how he's handled the expansion draft. And I think rightly so, but you know, the one thing that you're getting with him, we always talk about character. We talk about class. We talk about treating people the right way. And I think it's paying dividends here. You know, he treated Jared McCann the right way. He created this environment where McCann is happy and he's able to translate that into a very team friendly deal. Exactly. I think you said it perfectly right there. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we knew Ron Francis was capable of doing. Um, and he just, like I said earlier, he hit it out of the park. Like there's only so many good, you know, ways we could say it, but the bottom line is it's just an amazing contract. And it means we get to keep a player who is, you know, really just starting to blossom into the player that I think all along people thought he could be or should be, depending on how you want to look at things. Um, but he's, you know, he is a goal scorer. He is capable of eating, you know, top line minutes uh, if you need him to. Uh, he's just going to be so good for the Kraken for the next little bit here, for the next, you know, five-ish years, five and a half years now. Uh, I just, I'm just so thrilled with it and I'm so happy to have McCann hanging around. And I think he's going to, you know, be a good part of the leadership group moving forward. I know everybody's, you know, wanting that C on his chest basically right away. I don't think that's going to happen overnight or anything, but just the fact that he was so confident in signing this deal and committing to Seattle and committing to this franchise and everything, I think says a lot about him and where he's coming from and his mentality to, you know, again, commit to this franchise, looking down, you know, a, a year from now and s guessing you know, you could reasonably assume you'd make a lot more money going to unrestricted free agency. I think we can almost all kind of agree on that. And he decided that, no, that's not what's important to me. It's more important that I, you know, kind of lay down roots somewhere. Keep in mind the Kraken are already the fourth team in his young career. So you can see why that would be important to him. Commit to a franchise. Know that that franchise is committed to me. I enjoy playing here. I enjoy wearing this sweater. And I feel like I'm finally getting the opportunity that I wasn't quite able to get other places before. And that's just, it means a lot to me. And so you sign this deal and it's just, it, it's awesome that we're going to be able to watch him for so long. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what he can turn into when he has a full off season here in Seattle, when he doesn't necessarily have to deal with some injury stuff that he's had to deal with earlier on in this season. And uh, just as this Kraken team gets kind of built around him, I'm really excited to see what the future holds for Jared McCann. Exactly. He's going to have a, you know, a different supporting cast around him too. You're going to add pieces uh, and he's going to be absolutely part of that core they talked about. And he's going to be able to buy a house. Finally. Mm -hmm. He said he's rented everywhere that he's been in the past. Uh, and he's looking forward to being able to buy a house. You know, I, I don't know, Dylan is that is 25 mil. Is that going to be enough? I don't know, in Seattle market now. I was going to say, know. you never know like downtown or something, right? Like, I don't know <laughs> totally the, the situation of everything up there. But uh, he should be able to find something to his liking, I would assume. Yeah, no, I think he'll be all right. <laughs> now, I want to cover one more thing with this contract because, again, just makes me feel good about it. Can we look at some comparable contracts here? Because I used Cap Friendly's contract comp okay. calculator and looking at the deals i'm just going to i kind of cover the ones that were over there were five contracts that were over a 75 percent match and you've got sam bennett recent one yeah uh you know four years at 4.4 elias lindholm when he was 23 six years at 4.85 mm -hmm. mika zabanejad five years at 5.35 in 2017 brian little five years at 4.7 and nazim kadri when he was 25 uh, six years at 
And those all seem, you know, caliber of player when they signed about mm-hmm. right, right? Yeah, and I was, was going to say, Jared McCann fits perfectly in with this group of guys. And I look at those deals, and I think just about every one, you know, was a really good deal. And certainly by the end of it, was seen as a bargain. Uh, yeah. No, I, all of them actively are bargains right now for the teams that they are on. And and it is. It's it's a good comparable group of guys because you think of Jared McCann, you think of Sam Bennett, Lynn Holmes, Binajad, Kadri. These are all guys that are, you know, up there in the top echelon of second line centers for sure. Like they're they're almost too good to be a second line center, but they don't quite hit that, you know, mark for being that mm-hmm. superstar all star guy uh, on a top line. So they're this. It makes sense that he's in there with this group because that's that's kind of how I see him as well. Um, and clearly this is what the market has decided the number is for these guys. But, you know, again, look at some of these deals when they were signed, they were signed years ago, five years ago for Zabinajad, six years ago for Kadri, Brian Little, 2013, you know what I mean? Like, like it's crazy that Ron Francis was able to get that value so many years removed from all of these other deals. Exactly. Going down the list, most of these deals are you know, 2015, 16, 17. Uh, you're really getting prices from a few years mm-hmm. ago, uh, which again, just makes the deal look even better. Right. For the same caliber of player. That's mm-hmm. that's what it's all about. So very happy to have McCann sticking around. Got that modified no trade clause through most of those years too. That's always nice as a little extra insurance for fans. No one, you know, not necessarily going to be leaving us. Uh, or trying to force their way out of town. Um, and everybody can now feel good about going to buy a Jared McCann jersey. Yes, exactly. That's, yeah, so. Yeah, definitely, for sure. And by the way, that modified no trade clause, the player submits a 10 team no mm-hmm. trade list. So that's how it works, which is nice because it's not too prohibitive, you yeah. know, on the team, too. If for some reason you absolutely had to move him or, you know, whatever happened, it's still doable. But the player has got that control where at least organizations he really doesn't want to go to, he can you know write that off. Exactly. So that was a great one. It seems like a good win-win for everybody involved, which is always a good thing. And then, like I said, from a Kraken fan perspective, I know everybody was already you know in love with the guy, but it just makes us all feel that much better about it. For all sure. right. If you're buying a jersey. Exactly. So next piece of news, Mark Giordano thousand games played it's just amazing for an undrafted guy to get to that mark and everything it's it's just been incredible and i'm very happy that we you know in seattle were able to see that moment yeah it's great to have such a milestone you know so early on in the franchise really you know i know most of those games with the flames but to be able to see that kind of history and for the team's first captain you know Mm -hmm. he's able to you know accomplish that while he's in seattle uh you know i i think is really great for the team and again just so impressive i you you can't say enough about going undrafted and then getting a thousand games in the nhl just how hard that is to do Mm -hmm. and how that speaks to to Mark Giordano's character, to you know his work ethic. I mean, you, you don't you don't get from point A to point B there without an insane amount of work, uh, mm-hmm. and and he really ought to feel proud of that. And you know, you have some players. A thousand games in the NHL is always an impressive milestone. It's always mm-hmm. impressive, no matter who does it. Yeah. But I, you know, there are certain guys that you know maybe a first overall pick or something where, you know, it's kind of expected if you just play the career long enough. But uh, I know for Giordano, it was never something that that was a given uh far from it and and something that he certainly will never take for granted and i think you know it maybe means a little bit more to him because of that exactly i i would have to assume that it would and uh you know not just all the hard work and everything but the fact that all that hard work that he put into it paid off in you know being such a good player and such a consistent player right that teams want you for over a thousand games that becomes a part of it too right it's it's easy to say that well you know you could play as long as you want to play but the teams also have to want to want you and that's a big part of this too and obviously calgary uh loved having him for as long as they could seattle now loves having him um and and just the consistency it takes to have a career last that long and especially to get to a thousand games played when you didn't play your first game until you're 22 
right? It speaks to the longevity of not just your body, but your skill and your mind and, and your work ethic and everything. It, it's really something that's impressive. Uh, really, really happy to have that around. Do we know, I, we know the team is going to honor him for this next game. Do we know anything around what that's going to look like? Uh, not exactly. I know it will be on the 16th. Uh, it will, you know, for that game against Tampa. Uh, I imagine it'll be a, a pregame type of ceremony thing. Did they already? They, they haven't given him the silver stick, right? That that'll be what it is. I would assume that's what it would be. I didn't see anything about that because obviously they were on the road when he hit the thousand game uh, mark. So I would have to assume that that'll be a part of it. Um, it'll be interesting too to see if Calgary maybe sends something in. I know that that would be nice. I, and I would think maybe they would. Yeah. Or maybe you wait until the next game in Calgary to do something. Mm -hmm. I could see that happening too, just so that the Calgary fans get to see it given that, you know, 949 of the games were played there or, or with <laughs> them. Um, I could see something like that, but you know, that's not something that you would normally even think about when it comes to something like this. But given that so many of those 15 years of his 16 seasons were played in Calgary. You got to think that the flames will somehow also be involved, but it's going to be something really fun to look forward to uh, this upcoming Wednesday. Yeah. And everyone make sure you're in your seats early for that. You know, mm -hmm. if you're at the game, you, you won't want to miss it. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, I'm sure the root broadcast will have it. Hopefully those of us that have to watch on Espen plus will be able to see it. That's sometimes a little dicey. Fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Otherwise, you know, uh, Twitter will be there for us. I'm sure you'll be able to record. Yeah, I'll be all over everything. it. Follow, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm on City Hockey on Twitter. Yeah, so that'll be good. But let's go ahead and dive and deep dive into kind of the main section of this podcast now, dovetailing off of the talk of the Thousand Game Celebration for Mark Giordano. As I said earlier, we are a week away from the trade deadline. We know the Kraken are shopping Geo. We know other teams are interested in Geo. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Now, I know we kind of have now maybe a better idea what Ron Francis is looking for in a trade involving Mark Giordano. So why don't you go ahead and fill us in on that, RJ? Right. So it's been reported that uh, the Kraken want, their asking price for Giordano is a first round pick uh, plus a prospect. So that is the reported asking price. That's what Francis is uh, reportedly asking teams for. What do you think of that price, Dylan? It's a little steep. Like I get, I get negotiating from a position of, you know, I'm going to ask for all this and then I can make a concession down to really something that I think is more realistic and also still very good for me, which in this case scenario, I would think would just be the first round pick. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's very, very pricey to think that you can get a prospect. And I'm assuming he means like a decent prospect, not just like, some you know seventh round pick from last year or whatever um it's it's a lot to expect that for a rental really of any kind much less a, a 38 year old defenseman rental exactly and i think it's certainly a high price i do not anticipate any team paying that price uh i would be extremely impressed if that's mm -hmm. what the price was uh good on francis if he can get that but i think we're looking at something less uh, but you know, I understand he, he sets his price high and that's, you don't want to budge on that too early. Mm -mm. You know, you don't want to go out with your asking price, be like, yeah, we want a second, you know, give us a second and, yeah. uh, you know, and just start there and have teams negotiate that down to a third or whatever it may be. Uh, but I don't know. I, I am a little bit worried just given the history with the expansion draft about mm -hmm. setting a high asking price and then do teams meet it? Do they not? And, and when do you eventually have to budge? Because that's something that was reported at the expansion draft that Ron Francis's price not to take a player or to basically to do something that you want him to do mm -hmm. in the expansion draft was a first round pick and a prospect. And at the end of the day, zero teams met that price. Yeah. None, not a single one. And Ron Francis, again, we don't know the details of the negotiations, mm -hmm. but they were never able to reach something that, that he felt made sense for him. So, and I think ultimately that turned out very poorly for the crack. And I think, you know, there probably was some value out there to be had as far mm -hmm. as teams, you know, maybe they wouldn't pay a first and a prospect, but, you know, maybe they'd pay a second, maybe they'd pay a third, just give you some kind of asset. And Francis ended up walking away with nothing. So I hope that doesn't happen here. 
you know, it's a little bit different of a situation, obviously, you yeah. know, he's building an entire team there versus now there's real time pressure. He's kind of, he has to move someone. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully it doesn't completely bust. I mean, you know, as much as I, you know, love Gio and having him around, I think if he doesn't get moved, you really got to wonder there. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we've kind of talked about it before and, the expansion draft stuff doesn't bother me as much as if it was to happen here with Geo, Kaliarn, Croak, some of these other guys that, that are rentals at a trade deadline when you know how this first season has gone. Because you could make arguments at the expansion draft that, you know, didn't necessarily want to do certain moves because you just don't know how it's going to go yet. You don't know what the team's going to look like, how competitive they're going to be, all that kind of stuff. You're working with so many unknown variables that you can just kind of, you know, kind of go all right, well, I'm just going to work with one thing that I know I can work with, and that is, you know, X, Y, Z. So I I understand that. And I also, I'm not a big fan, even though it makes sense, I'm not a big fan of making trades just essentially to make trades or just to get in, you know, a mid-round asset. Could we be shopping every single one of these rentals to get third and fourth round picks? Yeah, we could. We could maybe get a, a, a fourth round pick for Riley Shahan. Does that mean we should? I don't think it's a good use of time, and I think it sends maybe a bad message to the fan base too, which is, well, anytime somebody doesn't have any term or whatever, we're just going to ship them off for nothing, and that's just the way it is. You know what I mean? So I, I'm, I'm okay with him kind of having higher asking prices and, and trying to stick to them. I do not think that you can pull um, a Brian Burke necessarily always and just be like, no, this is my, you know, my price. And if it's not hit, I'm just going to, you know, sit with it. And if I then just lose this player for nothing in free agency, that's just what I do. Because when it comes to more valuable pieces like a Mark Giordano, you can't afford to do that over the long run as a general manager. It's, it is that's where the responsibility flips back around your responsibility to the fans in a situation like that is to get a return back for them. And so it's going to be interesting to see here. I have to assume that he's thinking, yes, I'm going to be talked down hopefully to a first and that'll be the real thing. Um, That just because I think that makes the most sense from a negotiation standpoint. I know so many GMs, I've heard so many different GMs talk about how they approach trade trades, uh, whether it be at the draft or at the trade deadline, that I know that there is no one certain way that people do this. Um, but it, I, I'm hoping that that's Ron Francis's way of doing it, not the Brian <laughs> Burke. I, no, that's just the price. And if it's not met, it's just not met. Exactly. So let's hope that's the case. And, you know, his history with Carolina, we've gone over that Mm -hmm. in depth in the past. It suggests that he's, you know, willing to to budge on maybe a price and come to something reasonable in Mm -hmm. the middle. Um, So hopefully that continues here. Uh, Exactly. So let's go ahead and take a look around the NHL, RJ. Where do we think Mark Giordano might land up, like like end up? Because I'm having a really hard time figuring this one out. There is a decent amount of defensemen that are probably going to be available at this trade deadline. Um, really, I think the only two we know for sure are going to be available is Geo and Sherratt. I think those are like the, the guaranteed rental guys that are going to be out there. I think na- other names have been like Klinberg. Dallas mm-hmm. could keep him and try to make a run. I don't know that it's a for sure there. Hampus Lindholm and uh, Manson in Anaheim. It's possible that the Ducks want to re-sign one or both of them longer term. They're also still kind of in the playoff race, but I don't know that they're you know, going to totally go for it in a situation like that. And then there's um, Chikrin in Arizona who just got hurt the other night. That could complicate everything. But he also has a lot of term left, so kind of a totally different situation from the Geo one. Young guy with term, very different than you know, 38-year-old rental. But looking around the NHL, RJ, I just... I'm having such a hard time trying to figure out where Geo fits in on a, you know, playoff bound contending team. It's a difficult puzzle to fit the piece, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And there were a few teams that we probably thought would be contenders, maybe let's say a month ago that really aren't looking like it now. Uh, you know, Calgary, the obvious first thought, you know, going back to Calgary and everything, 
you know, I, I think they already made a trade to bring in Tyler to Foley. I think they've probably got other areas that they're looking at deadline wise. I just, I don't see him going there anymore. Uh, and Toronto, I, I mean, even a week ago that we figured that would mm-hmm. be probably the likely destination. Now it seems like goaltending is probably their biggest issue and, and where they might be focused. Um, and I think they've just got other things to worry about. And I, I don't know that, um, Geo's really as much on their radar anymore. Um, one destination, though, new destination that I think may have opened up, and I, I should know this whether they, you know, how desperate they'd be for a left side defenseman, uh, you know, versus someone on the right side, but Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. King's blue line is just destroyed right now. I mean, you look at, you know, their, their six defensemen, I think, in their last game against San Jose, or did they play one since? But in their last game, the six defensemen in the lineup were Oli Mata. So it's Mata, Spence, Bjornfot, Dersey, Muverer. Is that his name? And and Austin Strand. Yeah. Like that's... how how many of those names instill you with confidence? And then Bjornfot also got injured in that game, and it didn't look good. Yeah, that is. Um, that's that's Oli Mata and a bunch of other guys that I've never heard of basically, you know what I mean? Like, like that's, that's almost how you can take that. Uh, it is, that is brutal. And I was going to say, cause we're going to talk about yarn croak after this. How crazy is it that in a lot of ways, the, the best trade partners for the Kraken are all in the division. I know, right. I know it it, it definitely feels like that. But part of that is the Pacific division is the only one with like legitimate, you know, tight four, five teams all in a really tight playoff race like you look to the eastern conference which would be the natural place to look because you know generally teams really don't like trading within the division and 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 even the conference but you look to the eastern conference and basically you know who all the playoff teams are going to be yeah like, there's that hard line pretty much already set i'd be very surprised if one of those eight does not make the playoffs that are in the spots right now Right. So you don't have people just, you know, trying to maneuver so that they can get there. Maybe a GM that's on the hot seat that's trying to maneuver to get to the playoffs to save their job or something, um, which, you know, those are the best trade partners because you can kind of <laughs> demand a little more from them. Um, obviously, almost all of those teams would want to still bring in pieces so that they can, you know, be a better competitor once they get to the playoffs. But like I said, there's just not quite that same level of desperation to call it what it is there from those eastern conference teams and but in the specific division where you have la edmonton vegas vancouver the ducks technically still aren't out of it you know reasonably it's that's just so many people for so few spots that it just creates this interesting situation and then you throw on the fact that there all those teams have kind of holes on them that are kind of obvious right Edmonton and Los Angeles they could use some help on the blue line there Vegas part of its injury I don't know that anybody can make a deal with Vegas or that they can make any deals because of their cap issues like that they'll would find be... a way to make one deal yeah somewhere I don't uh, think it's Geo, but they'll find a way right I don't necessarily know that Anaheim would be adding either but the point is the Pacific Division looks the looks like the best candidate for you know having a bunch of teams that might be interested and so i do want to ask this question rj how would you feel about seattle making a deal within the division totally fine totally fine with it and certainly for a rental basically for an upcoming ufa you know it only hurts you this you know quote unquote hurts you makes your opposition in the division yeah. better this season uh, the kraken haven't really developed any rivalries you know there's you know maybe if you're talking edmonton and calgary you know you might not want to trade one to the other and make the other one better uh you know because of for rivalry reasons but the kraken just don't have anything like that uh so it really does make sense if the best offer you get is in the division don't hesitate at all uh you need to get the best return you can and i just i don't think there's any reason not to uh i and i agree that was the stance that i was thinking Again, because we're talking about rentals, and in Geo's case, you're talking about a 38-year-old rental, I don't know. You always run the risk with a rental that they're going to go there, enjoy it, maybe they go on a playoff run, and yeah, maybe, you know, worst case scenario in this sense is you have to see that other team lift the cup at the end of the playoffs. But really, the only thing you have to worry about is that player re-signs with that team. But I don't know that... Go ahead. In Geo's case, how long would that even be for, honestly? Um, Right. You're just... The, the downside is really limited. 
yeah, it would be a year or two. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem. And I agree with you. LA was one of the two teams that I kind of had in my mind that made the most sense for, for Geo. The other one being the Rangers, just because the Rangers this year seem obsessed with just playing low event hockey. Like they just don't score goals. They don't allow goals. They're like, Hey, games just happen. And then we just move forward and we somehow win most of them. Like, I don't... <laughs> you know, that'll yeah. do it. Yeah. So um, I thought that the Rangers might look at him. I know that, you know, that was one of those situations and destinations talked about earlier on in the year. I don't really know where they're at right now. It would, I don't know if the Rangers need to add anything right, realistically or if it makes sense for them. Right. They're, you know, they, they are what they are and they're very good at it as a team, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, we'll see if they feel the need to add. Yeah. But LA would be very interesting. It would certainly be a signal that LA sees their rebuild as over. Um, mm -hmm. They're, they, they would be, you know, trading a, a good draft asset for a defenseman that is clearly there for the shorter term. Even if he does yeah. resign, it is not going to be a big long-term thing, but I, I kind of feel like the team is there. Right. And, and I think, you know, whether, whether it's geo or not, I could just see them making that trade. I think they want to reward the team that's there mm -hmm. for a great position. They put themselves in mm -hmm. and they are really needing help on the blue line. They yeah. desperately need it. Yeah. In this, in this tight playoff race in the division, you don't want that to be the thing that kind of sinks this really fun, good season mm -hmm. that you're having. Um, and, and all the confidence that it's building in all your young players and all of that stuff. You don't want injuries to kind of derail that. It, I think in the long term, that would be much worse for you. But yes, looking at their injury report, it's just, it's crazy how many guys they have hurt right now. Not just on the blue line either. Like, it's, it's pretty brutal yep. there. And, they, and yet they won their last game with all those guys beat up. They beat the Florida Panthers. Yeah. You know, that's impressive. I think you if, if you're Rob Blake, you've got to do something to help those guys out because they deserve it. Exactly, and uh, it's all Todd McClellan, ARJ. Eh, uh, regular season, he's never had a problem <laughs> with the regular season. Let's wait for the playoffs start and they get swept by Vegas. That is true. That is true. Okay, so that's that's Geo's situation. Cal Yarncrook's the other guy that we've identified, and it sure seems like other teams, other media has all kind of identified as well as being the, you know, the other Kraken most likely to be traded. So let's let's look at destinations and potential compensation that the Kraken could see for Callie Yarncroak. So first and foremost, RJ, can the Ron Francis get a first rounder back for Callie Yarncroak? You know, I actually would say, I think it's possible. Nor most years, I, I don't think so, but given what the market is, I think the defense market, you're going to have a hard time selling. I think that's why Geo, you're certainly not going to get that asking price. But for the forward market, especially someone who's turned it on as recently as Yarncroak has, and I mean, he is just hot right mm -hmm. now and teams will see that. And, and a guy like him who can play any position, I mean, geez, he was playing center, you know, a, a week ago <laughs> uh, when they needed it, you know, he can play any forward position uh, who can score and is so good defensively. I mean, those are the guys that win you Stanley cups when you bring them in. So yeah, I think you could get a first round pick and I know it's a different, I know, you know, he's a rental versus, you know, uh, this guy that I'm going to talk about had a year of term left. But I think of a Barkley Goodrow mm -hmm. that the Lightning brought in. Um, you know, just having that guy in, in on a, putting it on your third line if you're a contending team. You know, Yarn Crook's just a perfect fit, and I think teams will pay up for that. Uh, I agree. I think that there is a chance. I, I wouldn't say necessarily hold your breath over it. Yeah, exactly. I think it's more likely it, it, they don't get a first than they do, but I do think it's possible. Yeah. So um, I, I agree with with um, your analysis there. So. I have two teams in mind for Cali that that okay. that makes sense for me. Now, briefly before we started recording, you were trying to guess the the one that in my mind makes the most sense. And I'm going to let you know now that when you were guessing St. Louis and Nashville, you you guessed right around this team when it comes to the standings because the team I think that actually makes the most sense to trade for Cali Yarncroke is the Minnesota Wild. Ooh, interesting. Because I look at this Minnesota Wild team, one, they don't have to worry about the cap situation of bringing him in this season. Um, I don't know that how active they're going to be, but the bottom line is they are in a playoff spot 
pretty solidly. Like I think that they're going to, you know, they could feel reasonably confident about making the playoffs this year. But when I look at what they need, just pulling up like uh, the, their roster on cap friendly, you got Joel Erickson Eck, Erickson Eck, mm-hmm. center. Who's their other center? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like they just don't, they don't have a, a center really that can help them out in a big way as, as being that second line center or, or a third line center that can do the jobs of that position. Right. And so I feel like, as you pointed out, we've seen yarn croak play center. We've seen yarn croak play center in Nashville. They have seen yarn croak play center in Nashville. I just think he would be a good get for them to come in and help them out, not only help them out there, but I think he could help out their power play, which is, all right, but especially help out their um, penalty kill, which is you know sitting at seventy six percent right now, and Oof. I and I think that he can really help make a big difference on that because they're the only like them and the Oilers are the only like big playoff teams in here. Well, and I guess the Kings that are down that low on the penalty kill, and we've seen what he's been able to do with the Kraken this year. So I think he'd be a good. It's not going to rock the boat for them because I know they like the group of guys that they have. And it wouldn't be like a long-term big trade. I know that they're still, you know, trying to get over the Parise Suter contracts, all that kind of stuff. But I just think that it would be a nice addition that can help bolster this group and and maybe see them out of their, you know, the first round of the playoffs in a couple of months. Well, you convinced me on those reasons. I, I think he is a good fit there. Uh, and yeah, I was sniffing around it, didn't quite hit it. Um and as for who their second center is, what you have no confidence in Miko Koivu and Victor Rask? Oh yeah, no. It's uh I, how could I forget had his number retired, don't worry about it. I know, that. I was gonna say, how could I have forgotten them? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, maybe not. Yeah. But um I was thinking Saint I mean you 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 know talked about it, but I was thinking St. Louis or Nashville. You know, Nashville, you know, kind of the obvious one. It's his former team. They know what he can do. They're in the playoff race. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to kind of gloss over that. But I, I think St. Louis, and more for kind of the opposite reason of Minnesota, I think, um, you know, their forward group is is pretty stacked. And to add a guy like that in the bottom six, you know, they're a team that's gearing up for a run this year. And I, I think they're, they're real close forward-wise. And he just fits kind of all these other bottom six forwards that they have you know, that are, that are responsible defensively, you know, they can play all these different positions. You know, I just, I think he fits really well, you know, put him with a Barbashev, Sunquist. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who's their other one that they have that uh, always causes teams fits. Well, they got Buchnevich now, Robert yeah, Thomas, Buchnevich. like they've, it's so deep. Yeah. You you add yarn croak to that. I think stylistically he fits really well. Mm-hmm. Um, I forgot they have Tyler Bozak there. I know. Um, I know. I'm looking at this roster. You got Peron Saad. Braden Mm -hmm. Shen playing well this year. Good for him. Yeah. And so normally I think, okay, you know, with that, you go target a D, but you look at the blue line, it looks pretty good too. Yeah. They're okay Um, there. So I think yarn croak is, is kind of the perfect luxury acquisition for the blues. You know, if they feel they want to do that. Right. And he would be a luxury acquisition. Um, you know, I, I said it to you right before we started recording. My first thought was the blues. And then I kind of looked at the roster and I was like, well, they just, he's, he seems redundant like many times over looking at this roster. (laughs) Um, So that's why I was like, I don't know that they would necessarily be the highest bidder for him. If there's any sort of bidding war, I think that's where I think maybe St. Louis kind of backs off a little. I don't know how aggressive they'd want to be about something like that. Uh, That would be the only question. But yeah, I mean, you're talking about a team that right now has nine players in the double digit goal, you know, category. Mm -hmm. Like that's crazy. And all forwards, like you've already got right. nine forwards with 12 or more goals. Are you kidding me? That's insane. And then you could throw Cali in there on top of that. Cause you're essentially talking about three full lines of forwards that have scored double digit goals already. Yeah. That, that's impressive. And you know, again, you add Cali Yarn Croak to that and it's, it's scary. That's for sure. It, it would be very, very scary. I think that would make St. Louis a very um, fun cup favorite bet you know in vegas <laughs> if you think that's really gonna happen maybe you go out and, and make that now um <laughs> the other team that i thought of rj and i'd love to hear mm-hmm. your thoughts of this vegas golden knights Ooh, tell me cali yarn you know wouldn't fit in perfectly with the system that the boars got them playing right now in vegas 
Yeah, and I said that they would find a way to do something. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, they're desperate, they're panicking. Because of Stone, they're going to have some of that extra cap room. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think they're going to be able to find a way (laughs) to make something work. And Yarn Croak, yeah, you know what? He he reminds me kind of a lot of the uh, the Yanmark acquisition uh, from last season, and you know who worked out well there. Um, and, and again, they need guys who can play wing and play center. You know, certainly with the injuries they've got, just go up and down the lineup. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? I I think that's actually even a better fit than than Minnesota. And you sold me on Minnesota. Yeah, um, the- and what? Let's see. It looks like they're going to have two point seven three five their projected deadline cap space. Right. And Yarn Croak's current cap hit is two million, but you have to assume Seattle can easily be talked into keeping half of that, for sure. retaining half. So you're talking about only a million dollar cap hit for for Cali for the rest of the season. The thing that gives me pause is Vegas would have to be very desperate for him given the state of their you know draft pool for this upcoming draft for sure you know they don't have a first round pick they don't have their own third they've got a second they've got the rangers third and they've got a couple fifths yeah but uh, no fourth, so they are but... a little short on draft yeah no fourth they are a little short on draft picks uh that's for sure and they've already you know sold some of their bigger pieces on the farm to get jack eichel mm-hmm. um you know they, they've got some interesting prospects though that that you know, maybe Francis, if he likes someone, could be sniffing around. Uh, but yeah, you'd probably look at the second round pick there as, as being a, a centerpiece of the deal. And then you'd probably want something else also. But hey, you know, if, if Vegas, if any team's going to swing big, it's Vegas. Yeah, I mean, they have to, right? Talking about their cap situation. The only reason that this is working right now for them is because Mark Stone is out. And that's, yeah. you know, you can't count on that going into next season. Um it's also working because Alec Martinez is out. That's a lot of money that they have out of the lineup right now on long-term IR. So this is their season. This really does feel like this is their go for broke. We have to try to get over that last hump and win a cup before things, you know, we have to make serious hard decisions in this off season. Right. And this is kind of the plan. I mean, you, you hear from owner Bill Foley and his whole plan from the start was Stanley Cup in five years. Yep. Going to win the Stanley Cup in five years. This is year five. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's put up or shut up time and, and no one knows it better than Foley does. And, um, you know, as uh, I've, I've heard Jeff Merrick say this a couple times on his various podcasts, but, you know, you know that DeBoer understands the struggles with the injuries. You know that McCrimmon understands, you know, the struggles with the injuries that, you know, well, this is what happens when you have 30 mil out of the lineup on a given night. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know that Bill Foley is going to understand that. And I think he might just want to swing for the fences. And if you're going to do that, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better fit than Yarn Croak. Exactly. So. It's going to be interesting. I, I think Vegas would be a very interesting look. Um, curious to see how the fans would react to that one, too. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> an interesting one. Let us know. Uh, tweet at us. Leave us a comment on YouTube uh, if, you, if you'd be okay with Cali going to Vegas and having to see him in that Golden Knights sweater. It would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't like it. I, I, I don't necessarily would either. That being said, if they give us you a know, nice return for him... Mm-hmm. Yeah. that's true yeah. if that's what the best return is then then you take it because that's what matters most exactly so um that's that's kind of what i had for yarn croak you have did you want to talk about nashville at all or not really i mean it, it's it it's simple enough we know exactly yeah. where he'd slot in we know exactly what he would do and they're they're in the playoff race so yeah uh i don't know that they're i, I guess they're always kind of desperate come playoff time but it just doesn't make it never makes sense for them to do the moves that they do at the trade deadline (laughs) they're never in a solid enough spot with a a solid enough roster to feel like a legitimate contender but every year that they'll spend you know a second or a first to bring somebody in to try to make them a little better just to get bounced by you know colorado st louis chicago all those years in the first round it felt like (laughs) right yeah no i mean that was kind of how it went with them you know for a while i think i don't know if uc sorrow stays as hot as he has been things could be a little different Mm -hmm. and maybe they want to bet on that they've got an extra third uh from the kings from the uh, arvidson trade so they could probably part with a second and and be okay Mm -hmm. uh but yeah that's just you know you you always think with the expansion draft guys all right well where'd they come from yeah (laughs) yeah 
uh, and what Nashville staring down, having to face Calgary potentially in the first round. I guess. Oh, yeah, that would be rough. <laughs> that's that is a brutal first round matchup there. So, um, that's that's what we were thinking when it comes to Giordano, comes to Cali Crook, the two guys that you know all the noise has really been around. Uh, for this trade deadline, we're gonna know, you know, basically almost before the next podcast rj hopefully we'll know before the next podcast that'll make the next podcast a lot more fun (laughs) yeah i'm excited just basically one you know next podcast we'll have you know pretty much all the trade deadline excitement all that stuff to cover Mm -hmm. really looking forward to the next one yeah me too uh and it helps because what there's only going to be two games between then and now for the kraken right let's see yeah we've got the 16th and the uh yeah and Detroit on the 19th that's it so it's going to be a light week from you know games perspective for the Kraken but it is certainly not going to be a slow week for the Kraken uh did we want to talk about the the road trip at all is it it better (laughs) better left unsaid all the all the L's except for the Montreal one yeah you know it's it's tough when i mean the, the montreal game at least like gives me a reason to think about talking about it we, <laughs> we're planning it was just going to be all losses that we'll we kind of just gloss over that yeah. talk about some of the more positive news some of the more fun stuff i guess we'll just bring up the if you don't mind the one thing that uh you know kind of blew up you know from the tweet that got the most action mm-hmm. uh on our twitter and that was angry grew yep angry grew bauer getting getting involved getting pushing pushing and shoving um yeah i I don't know like what do you we've talked about this on post game but Mm -hmm. angry goalies there's just something that resonates with people there is is well because it's it's his it's hysterical it's the stay puff marshmallow (laughs) man effect of them in all of this padding they they look simultaneously ridiculous and intimidating right Goaltender, for whatever reason, when play is going on, goaltenders look very intimidating as they're like crouched down, ready for a shot. They look all cool. They got these quick reactions, make great glove save or whatever, right? And then the moment play stops and they stand up like regularly, like a normal human being, they look insane. And then you see the ones on the bench with no mask on and they're just like this little head being swallowed by these shoulder pads because they're sitting down that are just going to engulf them. Like, it's just what it is so then when you see him upset it's it's kind of that like the toddler that just learned to walk when they're upset (laughs) you know and they're kind of stumbling and fumbling around that's what it is it's just you can't help but laugh that's you know that's a good explanation (laughs) and uh yeah it's something where it certainly resonates with lots of people myself included Mm -hmm. like I, i love seeing that but again, just had a hard time explaining why. Thank you for making sense of it there, Dylan. I think for some people, it might also be that, you know, goaltenders we think of as being the like calm, cool and collected ones because they have to be for their job. And so then when we see them lose their cool, it's like, whoa, they must have really done something to get after them. <laughs> but, That's true. That and and, true. and with Guru, how dare that bad man do that awful thing to our amazing goaltender, you know? Exactly completely unacceptable he grabbed his arm and was pulling him back should have been you know five minute major and a suspension easy 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 all day (sighs) but uh that's a fun way to leave it i think angry goalies yeah for sure yeah it's it's a good one um all right everybody so thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the deep dive as always hope you enjoyed it uh thanks so much to everybody for all the support that you've given us this whole season uh st- stick it with us you know and stick it with the kraken through thick and thin we appreciate it i'm sure the kraken do as well uh it's been quite a fun ride so far and uh looking forward to this first trade deadline in franchise history it's gonna be gonna be really really exciting yeah we'll see you for that all right so with that so uh, we'll see y'all next week 